May I have your attention, please? Before I turn the time back to Marianne, let me just share one quote. There are so many quotes from Dr. King that um, kind of stop me in my tracks every now and then and, and make me really consider how do I live my life and how would he want me to be living my life. And um, you know, regardless of your politics, I hope most of you listened to the State of the Union last night. I know some, for some of you, you probably listened to it maybe with a hope to catch some flaw. Others of you may have listened to it with a cheering section and, and applauding efforts. But one of the things that I was struck by in that State of the Union was the call for um, unity and the call for hope. Um, and I really appreciate that about our president. I think America has great hope if we could get out of our own way sometimes and consider each other as 
brothers and sisters, I think we'd be in a better space. Thank you. So this is one of Dr. King's messages that I think was echoed by our president last night and I just think might be a nice way to stage our, our morning together. So Reverend King says, I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word. I love that and I hope that that will resonate with you and that you'll have a great opportunity today to reflect on the other phenomenal things that Dr. King taught us. So welcome. Good morning. Actually, now it's afternoon. <laughs> uh, just before we get started, I wanted to share with you Coretta Scott King's words about this particular holiday. And she wrote, the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday celebrates the life and legacy of a man who brought hope to America. We commemorate as well the timeless values he taught us through his example, the values of courage, truth, justice, compassion, dignity, humility, and service that so radiantly defined Dr. King's character and empowered his leadership. On this holiday, we commemorate the universal, unconditional love, forgiveness, and nonviolence that empowered his revolutionary spirit. This holiday honors the courage of a man who endured harassment, threats, beatings, and even bombings. We commemorate the man who went to jail 29 times to achieve freedom for others, who knew he would pay the ultimate price for his leadership, but kept on marching and protesting and organizing anyway. Dr. King once said, that we all have to decide whether we will walk in the light of creative altruism or the darkness of destructive selfishness. Life's most persistent and nagging question, he said, is what are you doing for others? And when Dr. King talked about the end of his mortal life in one of his last sermons on February 4, 1968, in the pulpit of Ebenezer Baptist Church. Even then, he lifted up the value of service as the hallmark of a full life. And he said, I'd like somebody to mention on that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I want you to say on that day, that I did try in my life to love and serve humanity. And so we all call you to commemorate this holiday by making your personal commitment to serve humanity with the vibrant spirit of unconditional love that was his greatest strength and which empire empowered all of the great victories of his leadership. And with our hearts open to this spirit of unconditional love, we can indeed achieve the beloved community of Dr. Martin Luther King. And now, we have a few artists who are gonna be sharing beautiful music in a moment, but I'd like to introduce our special guest, Michael Lucarelli. Michael is a critically acclaimed Utah classical guitarist who has enthralled audiences throughout the U.S. and abroad for over 30 years. He is known for his diverse programming and expressive style where he blends classical, popular jazz, Spanish, South American, 
and original compositions. And so I turn it over to Michael. Good afternoon. Uh, you 
better get ready because when Pastor Davis comes up, you better be able to respond. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you. I am Jack, or formerly Jackie Hessler, and I direct Career and Student Employment Services for Salt Lake Community College here. It is rare to have a speaker who is able to speak to audiences on whatever level they may receive his message. Franz A. Davis hails from Gulf, Georgia. He has served in the United States Air Force as an aircraft mechanic and as a Vietnam veteran. He went on to earn his bachelor's degree in rhetoric from the University of California at Berkeley and his bachelor of science degree in religion from Westminster College. He earned his master's degree in mass communication from, uh, and holds a doctorate of divinity from Northwestern Nazarene University. He has attended several other universities, including Tuskegee Institute and Laney College in Oakland, studying subjects ranging from Afri African American studies to, to arts and humanities. He has taught as an associate professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City for more than 30 years. Recently retired, he now holds the position of Professor Emeritus at University of Utah. He has written several publications, including Light in the Midst of Zion and A History of Black Baptists in Utah. Franz A. Davis is a former member of the Salt Lake Community College Board of Trustees. He now serves as Vice Chair of the Utah State Board of Regents. He certainly has experience in the credentials to speak to your mind. During the 1960s, uh, Franz Davis participated in the Civil Rights Movement and marched from Selma, Alabama to Montgomery, Alabama, promoting voting rights for African Americans. At the onset of the Civil Rights Movement, he met Dr. Martin Luther King. As a political activist, he was instrumental in declaring the Martin Luther King Jr. Day as an official holiday in the state of Utah. And, and achieved for an achievement for which his church offices, his church office was riddled with gunshot. He has been and continues to be a social activist and advocate for human rights. He is the founder of the Francis A. Davis Scholarship Fund, seeking to aid students in their educational endeavors. He certainly has the experience, fervor, and passion to speak to your heart. The Reverend and Pastor Francis A. Davis received his spiritual calling into the ministry as a young man. In 1972, Pastor Davis came to Salt Lake City to fulfill a one-year teaching fellowship at the University of Utah. That same year, he joined Calvary Baptist Church where he was called to be pastor and chief administrator. Reverend Franz A. Davis has served as pastor of Calvary Baptist Church for over 40 years and counting. In addition to meeting the spiritual needs of his congregation, Pastor Davis is a model of exemplary community service, bridge building, and committed mentorship. Pastor Davis has, has said that education is a gateway to success, and we must enhance, opportunity, enhance these opportunities for our youth to excel. He certainly has the calling, compassion, and spiritual foundation to speak to your heart. It is my honor to introduce the Professor Emeritus, the State Regent, so he will speak to your mind if that's where you want to receive him, the Civil Rights Activist, the Human Rights Activist, where he will speak to your heart, and the Reverend and Pastor Franz A. Davis, who will speak to you from the soul. After we, after we hear from Ms. Glory, and Brother DeBron, the next voice you will hear will be Pastor Francis A. Davis. DeBron Hutchinson is a Salt Lake Community College nursing program academic and career advisor. And he is also a highly sought after gospel pianist. Glory Johnson Stanton is the academic and career advisor for the African, African American students at SLCC, and she is also the club advisor for the Black Student Union, and an amazing vocalist, Gloria Duran.
to uh, Jack Hessler. I'm going to have Jack mail that uh, introduction to my wife. I'd like her to know who I am. <laughs> I mean, listen, uh, I mean, uh, maybe she'll treat me right uh, uh, once, once she know who I really am. Uh, thank you, Jack. I appreciate uh, that introduction. Good afternoon to all of you. Good afternoon. I apologize to those of you over here for whom it is not a good afternoon, and we'll try it one more time. Good afternoon to all of you. Oh, what a joy it is to be here and to be able to join you in celebrating as you honor those humanitarians uh, that have uh, done so much for this campus. And I want to pay my tribute also to those humanitarians. Uh, you are at a uh, precious place, Salt Lake Community College. This uh, is the premier community college in the country, uh, perhaps in the whole world. And for you to be here as a part of the team is just a real joy. And we are doing a great work, and you are doing a great work. And I want to commend you. And under the leadership of your new president, I hope that you will put your shoulders to the wheel and keep hope alive and do everything that you can that's within your power uh, to get this job done. Thank you for inviting me, Marion, to uh, be the uh, uh, speaker. And I uh, notice uh, your family is here, and it's always a joy uh, to meet them. Uh, I want to uh, do three things, if you don't mind. First of all, I want to add just uh, one more connection, uh, one or two more things that will connect me to the Martin Luther King holiday celebration. Uh, then I want to say a couple of things about Utah's connection to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and this celebration. And then lastly, I want to say three or four things that I believe uh, each of you ought to be looking at as you uh, celebrate uh, this particular holiday. Uh, to start with, uh, I was on my way back home from having worked in Asbury Park, New Jersey in 1963. And when I got to Washington, D.C., I saw the sight of a lifetime. I thought I had left all of the outhouses down in Georgia, but they were on the streets of Washington, D.C. Outhouses everywhere, buses and uh, cars and trucks, and people milling around as if the world had come to an end and everybody had come to Washington, D.C. for the end of the world. I said to my sister, what's going on? Why are all of these people here? And why all of those outhouses on the streets downtown in the capital of the United States of America. And she said to me, well, don't you know that Dr. Martin Luther King and the marches on Washington are going to be here, that they're here, and they're going to be here tomorrow. And that was the day that Dr. King delivered that most famous speech. I have a dream that one day my four little children will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. So I stayed around and heard him. Can I remind you that all day long we listen to boring union leader speeches, uh, boring congressman speeches, boring other uh, civil rights leaders, songs and one comment after the other. And then Dr. King stepped up to the podium and it was like turning on electrical current. When he began to speak, his voice went out in a way that you could never imagine and there was an eerie sort of feeling that I still get every time I go there to, to remember that Dr. Martin Luther King delivered that I have a dream speech. Well, <clears throat> that was my first experience with him. And then the next year, I happened to be a student down at Tuskegee. How many of you know about, about Tuskegee? Uh, those of you who didn't raise your hands, you really got to learn at least one thing about Tuskegee if you want to graduate from this school, Salt Lake Community College, and have your self-respect. You got to know that peanut butter was invented at Tuskegee. Now, of course, you students don't eat peanut butter anymore. Uh, you eat lobster tails and steak and all of those sorts of things. Uh, but when I was a college student, it was peanut butter. And that was invented. So I'm a student at Tuskegee, and Dr. King comes down, and I have the privilege of a lifetime. I get to one-on-one -on -one have an interview as a reporter for my campus newspaper with Dr. King and get to write an article about him and the interview that I had. What a delightful, delightful person. A great big head and broad shoulders with a little body, 
but with a tongue that spoke wisdom and reminded us all that it's important to keep hope alive. So I met Dr. King, and then just a month or two later, I met Malcolm X, and I compared the two and decided I wanted to sign up for the Martin Luther King journey, not the Malcolm X journey, the choice between the two, and I made personally the choice. 50 years ago this March, then I was one of those who was on the forefront of the march from Selma to Montgomery. How many of you have seen the movie, Selma? The rest of you need to go, it'll be your dollars well spent to go see Selma because it will remind you of the journey that we had to take in order to help people to be able to register and then be able to vote. And so I was one of those students and I was there when Dr. King said, how long, not long, for truth crushed to the ground will rise. How long? Not long. No lie shall live forever. How long? Not long. You shall reap what you sow. How long? Not long. The arch of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. How long? Not long. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. I was waiting for uh, Gloria Stanton to sing that song. Uh, what, a, what a tremendous, give her a hand one more time. <laughs> what a tremendous voice. But Dr. King, I was there when Dr. King delivered that speech. We, we were on, we, uh, he was on a stage with two 18-wheel truck trailers backed up to each other in front of the capital of Montgomery, Alabama, and we looked up to where we think the capital's uh, uh, main resident was, uh, Governor Wallace, and the curtains kept fanning back and forth, and we knew that he was watching uh, us as we were out there for that march from Selma to Montgomery. Well, that's my connection with Dr. King. Now, of course, the result of that was and you'll be interested in this, I got kicked out of school because of that. <laughs> At the end of that school year, I received a nice letter from the dean. Dear Mr. Davis, thank you for coming, but next year don't bother coming back. You didn't go to class enough. And so they kicked me out of school. Now if you were African American and you got kicked out of school back in the 60s when I did, one other thing was also guaranteed to happen. You were guaranteed to get a letter from Uncle Sam. And I got a letter from Uncle Sam, but just before I got it, I made a deal with the Air Force recruiter that he'd take me in the Air Force. And so I joined the Air Force and served my country <coughs> for four years after that. Well, that's enough about me. Let me tell you about the connection between this holiday that we're celebrating this week and the state of Utah. You do know that Congress passed the law and declared the third Monday in January as a legal public holiday for the whole United States of America. But Utah was one of seven states that said, not here. We don't care what Congress says back in Washington, not here. We don't care if President Reagan signed the law into effect, a Republican president for a Republican state, but not here. And Utah decided they were not going to celebrate Martin Luther King holiday. So Senator Terry Williams, Dr. Forrest Crawford, myself, and ultimately Representative Robert Sykes introduced the bill in the state legislature. And in the first year, they beat me up, so I was the chairman of the committee. They beat me up as if I was, well, they just beat me up. <laughs> and here are three things that they beat me up with. Number one, they raised with me the issue, why should we have a celebration of the birthday of Martin Luther King in Utah when he was never here? By a show of hands. How many of you know if Dr. Martin Luther King ever came to Utah or not? <coughs> Dr. King came here, got to, got to Denver, Colorado, got off the airplane on his way to Salt Lake, got to Denver, Colorado, and in those days, unlike you with a cell phone, you had to find a pay phone. He got off the airplane to make a phone call and got left. Dr. J.D. Williams, professor of political science at the University of Utah, held the audience for two hours, and Dr. King chartered an airplane and flew on into Salt Lake City. 
And on the front page of the Tribune and the Deseret newspaper is the picture of Dr. King right here in Salt Lake City, Utah. So they beat me up with that, and I was able to show them the newspaper, and they backed off. And then they said to me, well, he was a womanizer and a drunkard. Now, uh, anybody know where that came from, where that idea came from? Mr. Hoover, who was in charge of the FBI, decided that Dr. King was a communist. And everywhere that he went, he also sent one of his agents or two, and they checked in the room <coughs> next to the room that Dr. King was in and bugged his room. And if they heard a grunt in his room, they said, oh, he's got a woman in there. And if they heard a slur in his room, they said, oh, he's drinking whiskey in there. Well, interestingly, after 50 years, the report has been issued that of the record of Mr. Hoover's people's information, and there's no evidence that he was a drunken or a womanizer. And so I presented that to the legislature. Well, the third thing they beat me up about, they said, well, uh, why shouldn't we have a holiday for Martin Luther King? We don't have a holiday for Brigham Young. <laughs> I say, you don't? I, what's the 24th of July? <laughs> I mean, uh, <coughs> but we don't have a holiday for Brigham Young. And so I agreed with them that they didn't have a holiday for Brigham Young. And then I suggested to them a solution to the problem. You give us Brigham City, and we'll name it Martin Luther King, and you can have the holiday for Brigham Young. They weren't about to do that. They weren't about to do that, and they backed off in a hurry. And then they were able to pass the bill after a year of education of the legislators. So we have a holiday. It was first named uh, Human Rights Day slash Martin Luther King. Anything wrong with that? Well, we already got a Human Rights Day in December. Why I have two human rights days? Well, the legislature finally, ultimately, after many years, renamed the holiday, Martin Luther King holiday, and it is today the third Monday in January, and the legislature has moved their opening session from the beginning of this week to the beginning of the week that is to come in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So we can celebrate. <laughs> We can celebrate the birthday of Martin Luther King Jr. because what he did was not just for colored people, but was for all people. Uh, by the way, when I was born, there were only two groups of people who lived in America. Either you were light-skinned enough to be considered white, or you were dark-skinned enough to be considered colored. If you happened to have been Hispanic, or Native American, or Asian, and were dark-skinned, you were colored. But if you were light, in those particular groups, then you would be considered white only. And by the way, there were some African Americans who were light enough that they could pass for white. But those were the only two groups that lived. But we celebrate. Now how we celebrate this birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King? A great debate all over the country about how to celebrate the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King. I believe if Dr. King were alive, he would say, first of all, you ought to pay attention, you ought to honor and pay tribute to the young people in our society. You ought to help them to stay out of gangs, help them to stay away from drugs, illegal mind-altering substances, <clears throat> and help them to stay alive long enough so that they don't have to face the violence that's going on in our society. I was talking to a little boy, six years old, riding a big wheel in downtown Salt Lake City, not so long ago. And as I talked to him, I asked him what his dreams were. And he said, I just want to be able to live long enough to graduate from high school. What a shame that a five, six-year-old young man is thinking about the violence that's going on across our country. Ferguson, Florida, New York, South Carolina, Saratoga Springs, Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah. The violence is going on where people are losing their lives and we've got to find a way to protect our young. And I believe that would be one of the things that Martin would urge us to do in this celebration. Second thing, and he's urged us to do what you are doing and that is to provide an opportunity so that people can be upwardly mobile and the only way for people to be upwardly mobile is to be able to get a good education. Now, there are a lot of ways to do that. You can get it on the job. 
You can get it by somehow getting a certificate. You can get it by having stackable credentials. You can get it by getting an AA, <coughs> by getting some other college degree. But everybody in here ought to aim to help everybody in our society to get as high a formal education as is possible. And when you've gotten that formal education and prepared as if everything depends upon you, then the third thing I believe Dr. King would say is wait until the ground swells. Don't be in such a hurry to rush off and do something. Wait until there are others who are ready to join you <coughs> in doing whatever. Wait until the ground swells. Wait until the people decide we're ready to move. And I suggest to you when the people decide that they're ready to move because you are prepared and because you have found out who you are yourself and make an, the, every effort to be the best that you can be, then we can change the society and with hope move ahead and somehow celebrate the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Lastly, I suggest to you that Martin would still be nonviolent, even though our society seems to be more violent. You know, when I was a child, if you, if you said the things that we say today about the President of the United States of America, Mr. Obama, they'd send somebody and they'd haul you away and you'd never be seen again. But now we can say anything about our President, we don't respect any of our leaders anymore, and we can just say anything we want about President Obama or about any other leader. I heard the name of the former college president of this college, one of the former college presidents, in so many vain ways. I sure hope you don't do the same with the new president. But we've got to learn how to be nonviolent in terms of our approach. Because nonviolence is a tool, Dr. King says, it is a knife that cuts and there's no blood. It's a knife that cuts and there's no blood. Violence, Dr. King said, is immoral because it thrives on hatred rather than on love. So to all of you who are here today as we celebrate this birthday and honor these humanitarians, as we pay tribute to the new president of this college and her team, and to each of you as part of Salt Lake Community College, the premier community college in the United States of America, as we pay tribute, today would be a good day to decide that you're going to do your part. And unless all of us do our part, then all of us are in trouble. I close with a good example. <coughs> Jack Hessler uh, uh, introduced me. He's an avid fisherman. And let's use him as the example, and it's not, it's not a true story, but let's just put him in it. <laughs> <coughs> Jack decides he's going fishing, and he takes his boat, and he goes down to Utah Lake, catfish fishing. <laughs> and he's out there in Utah Lake, and his son Morgan is standing on the other end of the boat. And they're fishing for catfish in the Utah Lake. And as they fish, Morgan decides that he's going to stand up on his end of the boat. And he points toward his dad's feet. And he begins to laugh. And his dad says to him, stop that laughing, boy. We out here to fish. And Morgan laughs more and louder. And the more he points and the louder he gets, his daddy gets agitated. And he says to him, if you don't stop that laughing and pointing and standing up in the boat, then we're going to have to stop fishing. And Morgan continues to point and laugh at his daddy's feet. His daddy says to him, all right, that's it. We're done for the day. Roll in your line. No more fishing here today. Morgan, as he begins to roll his line in, his dad says to him, oh, by the way, what are you laughing at? And what are you pointing at? And Morgan says to Jack Hessler, your end of the boat <coughs> is leaking. <laughs> now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, uh, but uh, I wonder what would happen if uh, Jack's end of the boat took on so much water 
that it began to sing. I wonder what would happen to Morgan's Ian. We're all in this boat together. And if my end of the boat is leaking and sinking, and you in the boat, when I go down, you going down too. So here's the challenge. Every time I go around, and I do it all every day, rabble-rousing about some issue, they say, there he is again, rabble-rousing about something. <laughs> and I always remind them I've got a colleague right beside me with a different skin color who's raising the same issue. And together, you and I can make a difference, but we have to do it together. So President Denise Huftelin and I are just going to have to join arms and walk arm in arm to make sure that diversity remains the centerpiece of this school and that those who are diverse on this campus have a home, that a place that they can call home and be at ease. You and I, as members of the community, are just going to have to join arms together and write letters to our representative government tell them that we are no longer going to tolerate things as they are and we've got to make a change and together we'll all be able to walk together so walk together children don't you get weary walk together children don't you get weary walk together children don't you get weary there's a great camp meeting in the promised land Thank you, Mary. Thank you for all of you. Thank you for being here. My privilege to share. I thought we'd take this time to share with you uh, what this humanitarian award is all about. The beloved community for Dr. Martin Luther King was not a lofty utopian goal to be confused with the rapturous image of the peaceable kingdom. Rather, the beloved community was for him a realistic, achievable goal that could be attained by a critical mass of people committed to and trained in the philosophy and methods of nonviolence. The core value of the quest for Dr. King's beloved community was agape love. Dr. King distinguished between three kinds of love. Eros, romantic love, philia, affection between friends, and agape, understanding, redeeming, goodwill for all. Agape love does not begin by discriminating between worthy and unworthy people. It begins by loving others for their sakes and makes no distinction between a friend or an enemy. It is directed towards both. Agave love is seeking to preserve and create community. Dr. King's beloved community is a global vision in which all people can share in the wealth of the earth. In the beloved community, poverty, hunger, and homelessness will not be tolerated because international standards of humanity, decency, will not allow it. Racism and all forms of discrimination, bigotry, prejudice, will be replaced by an all-inclusive spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood. At this time, it is my pleasure to continue a tradition that was started eight years ago where, where we come together and in the spirit and, and in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King's vision and in celebration of the best that our community can be and aspires to be, we want to present individuals with the Salt Lake Community College um, Martin Luther King Award. We present individuals who are from the Salt Lake Community College community, as well as individuals who we regard because of their example of 
of compassionate service and of their and their lives that we regard as as partners and allies in our march forward to realize the vision of the beloved community. Um, before we present the awardees this year, I just would like to recognize our first MLK Award recipient who's in the audience, Dr. John McCormick. And so at this time, I will read the read bios of the award recipients and we'll have them come up and maybe if we have a minute or two, they can say something as we present them the awards. Our first recipient is Dr. Jeffrey R. Brueger. Dr. Brueger received a BA in English and a BA in psychology from the University of Utah. He received a Master's of Science degree from Utah State University and a Doctor of Philosophy with a concentration in educational administration from the University of Utah. Dr. Brueger retired from Salt Lake Community College in 2009. He began his professional career at the college in 1969 when it was still named Utah Technical College at Salt Lake. From 1969 to 1973, he served as the apprenticeship coordinator and general education instructor. I hear that he, that he may have taught the first gen ed course at Salt Lake Community College. In 1973, he was promoted to the position of division chair, apprenticeship program, and served in that role until 1979. SLCC again recognized Dr. Brueger's skill and leadership ability and selected him to serve as Associate Dean, School of Vocational Education until 1982. From 1982 to 2000, Dr. Brueger was Dean of the School of Continuing and Community Education due to his vision and commitment to quality affordable education from 2000 to 2004, Dr. Brueger served SLCC as Executive Dean of South City Campus. His final assignment as SLCC was, was the position of Dean of Arts and Communication from 2005 to 2009. At the conclusion of Dr. Brueger's tenure at SLCC, he stated, I've had the opportunity to learn about many different components of the college. Collectively, collectively, these administrative assignments have given me the ability to see how every part of the college contributes to its mission. Today, Dr. Brueger continues his lifelong interest in philosophy, literature, language, music, meditation, camping, and hiking. He lives in southern Utah on a small farm with a variety of small farm animals, enjoys growing vegetables, flowers, and living life. Please welcome to the podium Dr. Jeffrey Brueger, the 2015 recipient of the SLCC Martin such an august group, and I'm getting older, so I made a couple of notes here. Uh, Clifton suggested, I believe, Dr. Sanders suggested that I might say a word or two about particular characteristics that uh, Dr. Newton, Dr. Martin Luther King had that I had admired. And I would like to start out by saying quickly that there's one advantage about being older, such as I am today, and that is I can remember back to the 60s. Dr. Martin Luther King emerged, and there were so many things that were going on in society at that time that uh, had to do with change. It was a time of rebellion, youth, and thank God for the youth. They keep doing it, and that's a good thing. But I think back to those days, it was not just civil rights and human rights, uh, equal rights, women's rights, gay rights. Um, all of those things were becoming extremely important the battle against stopping the war in Vietnam, um, the battle against materialism, against the idea that you didn't have to own in a whole bunch of things. It was the age of a generation of people that were very concerned about changing the world. And we spent a lot of time thinking about changing it. And we donned our headlong hair and our worn out clothes, and we marched, and we tried to change things. 
And there was one man that really had an impact in terms of that change, and that was Dr. Martin Luther King. And again, Clinton asked uh, me to uh, perhaps say a couple of things about uh, the things about Martin Luther King that I admired, and of course he was a man of vision, a man of principle, um, a man of caring. But I think the thing that I most think about Dr. Martin Luther King was his courage. Um, you know, I try and imagine what it must have been like. For me, being a white man, back in those days, it was exciting. It was a time to change society and make it better. I didn't have to face a lot of the things that black people in the South had to face. I didn't have to face the anger and the hatred the way they did. When I think about Dr. Martin Luther King standing up for his principles and his rights, and the rights of all people, not just black people, but all people, in the face of that anger, with threats against his life, threats against his children, threats against his friends, threats against what he believed, and he had the courage to be able to stand up to his principles and for his principles and proceed with being the leader that he was. That, to me, is absolutely amazing. I try and imagine myself in that kind of situation, and I know I don't have the courage to do that. He had a great deal of courage. But I have to say, that aspect of his courage is not as important to me as another aspect of it. And that's been alluded to today by both uh, Marion and by uh, Reverend Davis. And a bit of a digression here. One of the things that, uh, that bothers me, and I'm sure bothers many of you in this present world, uh, is the violence that's here. It's everywhere. Uh, I gave up watching television many, many years ago. I can't see any worth in it. But I do like to go to a movie occasionally. But one of the things that I've noticed when I go to movies is the violence that's there for young people to see. There's man fighting man. There's man fighting animals. There's man fighting machines. There's man fighting aliens from other star systems. Even in a movie like The Hobbits, there's elves fighting elves. There's elves fighting dwarves. There's dwarves fighting men. Everybody's fighting everybody. And they finally come together in a glorious battle where they fight the orcs. Everybody fights. And to bring that back to Dr. Martin Luther King and what I think is his great courage is his use of nonviolence. The fact that he was able to care and stand for his vision and refuse to strike back. Again, that's something that's beyond my understanding. If somebody confronts me, I'm going to fight back. And that's not something that he would do in a physical way. He did it in a kind and a caring way. And I admire him greatly for that. And I think it's a lesson that all of us should carry forward in this violent, violent world that we have. It's an awful place for many people. And that kind of caring that Dr. Martin Luther King had is extremely important. So for me, on this particular day, to be honored here as I am by such a great man, and on the great man's celebration. I really thank those who thought to make this award to me, and those who supported it, and I thank you all. Our next awardee is Mr. James Lawson. James Lawson retired from Salt Lake Community College in 2013. He was first hired in 1973 as the Material Distribution Center Manager. In 1978, James worked with a team to establish the budget office as a planner. In 1980, he transferred to SLCC Division of Continuing Education and served as the Principal Accountant Budget Office Specialist. Over the years, James' management expertise and leadership abilities were recognized with progressive upgrades to his professional assignments. James concluded his employment with SLCC as the Budget Center Manager for Continuing Education. Throughout the years at SLCC, James uses professional skills developed from training in the Army Security Agency as an analyst in formal and formal education at Salt Lake Community College and Westminster College in Accounting and Business Management. He has also received a Utah State Contractor License specializes in tile and flooring installation, and he has established a small business. 
Over the years, James has nurtured a passion for service to others by doing missionary work from North Carolina to Vietnam. He has also volunteered to coach a youth soccer team and has served as local parent-teacher association president. Additionally, James has served in various PTA board positions. Further, he has served as general member of the State Board of Directors of the Utah Public Employees Association. Today, James runs a small business and continues his passion for volunteerism. He regularly works with various programs throughout the state that support worthy charitable causes. And these programs include the Road Home, Cancer Awareness, and the Utah Food Bank, among others. So please welcome to the stage to receive the 2015 Martin Luther King Salt Lake Community College Award, Mr. James Lawson. Tired, you have to clean yourself up, you know, to, to be in, in the uh, midst of fine and gracious people. So I went to the hairstylist. And I said to her, Now you got you to help me get a good style haircut. There was a little pause, and a little fear came on her face and she said really I said yes I'm gonna be amongst very important people she paused as I paused she stepped back and had me look in the mirror <clears throat> really she says and I says well maybe take a little off the top <laughs> she says I can do that and as I was watching her buzz me, I, re I realized that I didn't have much to offer her. I mean, there was nothing, nothing much there. It reflects to me the difference between what I have on top of my hair and what Dr. Martin Luther King gave us. It's a contrast, very, very, to me, very, very vivid. He gave us many things. What I remember, because I was with Jeffrey, you know, we were young. We were, we were kind of isolated here in Utah. But the things that I have learned through the years, that he left us a legacy. He was a minister, and he knew his gospel. And I believe, from the bottom of my heart, that he believed that we should love God and love our neighbor. And he stood for that. He stood erect. As his home was bombed, his children being victimized, if you want to call it, by bigotry, if you want to put it up. He stood amongst his friends and his neighbors who took up arms to go fight the fight. And he said to them, in effect, this is not the way we're going to win. And he, they, and he talked them down. That's a legacy to me. That's a legacy to all of us. That even in his most trial at that point in time, he was able to see that he, as he stated, he was his brother's keeper. Can we say that? Can we say that in our community? to our neighbor, to our city, to our county, to our state, to our nation, to our world, that we can be a brother's keeper. 
It's hard to imagine that he gave his life for that intent. Nonviolent. He attributed a lot of his ideas to Gandhi. He felt compelled that nonviolence was the foremost way of turning the world and making it a better place. I had a bunch of notes. Do you want me to get them out? No. <laughs> he also gave us the attitude that if we can be closer to ourselves, that we, if we understand ourselves, we can understand those we serve. That he realized that through his knowledge and through his love for mankind, he could understand them. Can we do that? Can we do that as an individual to help understand our neighbor and love them as we'd like to be loved? He has left that legacy. And Jeffrey pointed out, you know, violence is there. But of course, I'm always on the opposite side of Jeffrey. No. <laughs> Wherever he's at, he's hiding now. <laughs> there he is. I love you to pieces. We we did a lot of we did a lot of stuff, and it was so neat that he uh, I could share this with him. But he's a great man and a great individual. He showed me how to be a better individual, as all of you have. Those that I've worked with. But the key factor to it is all that somehow, somewhere, or sometime, we all have to look inside, inside ourselves and become Dr. Martin Luther King. I hope I do. Thank you. Our third recipient um, could not be with us today, but let me read a little bit about her. Um, Karen Killinger, who is recently retired from Salt Lake Community College. Professor Karen Killinger received her, her BBA in Business Administration and Management from Fort Valley State College in Georgia. She also learned, earned an MBA, Master's of Business Administration and Avi Aviation from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Professor Killinger was first hired by Salt Lake Community College as an adjunct instructor for the School of Business in January in 1995. Professor Killinger was later hired as full-time faculty member in September of 1995. She taught a full complement of business management courses and she served on the General Education Committee, Faculty Teaching and Learning Center Committee, SLCC Institutional Review Board, several Salt Lake Community College hiring and search committees, and a range of community engagement committees. And as I said, Professor Killinger retired from Salt Lake Community College January 1st of this year. Um, unfortunately, she's not able to be with us today, but in her absence, let's, um, let's give a warm congratulations to Karen Killinger. Our final recipient, a friend of ours from the community, and the SLCC 2015 Martin Luther King Award goes to NeighborWorks Salt Lake. NeighborWorks Salt Lake, a private nonprofit 501c3 company, opened its doors in 1977 with the mission of revitalizing neighborhoods and creating affordable housing by providing dynamic and creative leadership through partnerships with residents, youth, businesses, and government entities. The NeighborWorks Salt Lake vision statement of rebuilding neighborhoods one block at a time has been visibly and successfully demonstrated in its target neighborhoods, including a large geographic area on Salt Lake City's west side running from, from 1000 North to 1700 South and from 300 West to Redwood Road. These boundaries include all or a portion of the Fair Park, Guadalupe, Rose Park, Glendale, Poplar Grove, and West Capitol Hill neighborhoods. 
In addition to the Salt Lake City area, Murray City has taken an important step in addressing housing needs identified in the housing market analysis um, adopted by the City Council by partnering with NeighborWorks Salt Lake. NeighborWorks Salt Lake has established a Murray office to work in collaboration with the City and Redevelopment Agency of Murray to provide additional housing services to the residents of Murray and to facilitate neighborhood revitalization in its Murray target neighborhoods. NeighborWorks Salt Lake has a proven track record of visible positive results in its target neighborhoods. And on behalf of NeighborWorks, neighbor let me call Billy Palmer to the podium to receive the 2015 Salt Lake Community College Martin Luther King Award. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Dr. Uh, Pastor Davis put so much love in the room earlier, and um, I just hope there's a little more left. So I'm, if there is some, I, I could use it because I won't do well up here otherwise. So, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> You're still here. Uh, Maria da Maria Garcia couldn't uh, be here today. She's our executive director. Um, she was called out of town, she's in New York, um, but she uh, sends her regards and, and is grateful for this award, as well as uh, our president uh, of our board, Sheldon Woods is here, and the rest of our staff and some of our board members as well. Um, but on behalf of Maria and our organization, I just wanna say that we are very humbled and uh, very honored to receive this. Um, as I mentioned, as was mentioned, I'm Billy Palmer, the Vice President of the Board of Directors of NeighborWorks Salt Lake and the Chair of the Youth Works Program, as well as a graduate from 1988. I really hate to date myself, but uh, in accepting this award, I might share, I thought I might share with you some words. I remind myself uh, this time of year. Um, it's personally how I, one of the things I do is celebrate Martin Luther King, and it's also, um, what reminds me of why I am involved with NeighborWorks and stay involved with my community. In 1967, in a speech titled, Where Do We Go From Here? Dr. Martin Luther King said this, power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice and justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. So I'm beginning to prepare words for today. I didn't even think that I would mention the word love. But it, it just came naturally. And after listening to everybody today, it's obvious, you can't talk about Martin Luther King without talking about love. So it occurred to me that this is probably the most appropriate word to use. Because a man so bold and brave as Dr. Martin Luther King, he used the word love almost every time he spoke. And I'm not sure I could describe what NeighborWorks does and what I see us doing every day without describing love in some way or another. So I'm very proud to be involved with NeighborWorks because I see it as an organization that exemplifies those words, power and love at its best. As I mentioned, my first experience with NeighborWorks was as a youth going through our job and social skills training program. My job title was community builder. Now I didn't get the job because I was a good community builder. In fact, the exact opposite was true. Um, I was in the court system and some very concerned individuals within the court system wanted to see me out of the system and onto a successful life. They wanted to see me get back to school, graduate from high school, get some job skills. And I'm, let me just say this, I'm very moved, uh, Pastor Davis, with the words you use today and it motivates me and, and it, it inspires me but I'm also um, 
really glad to know I'm not the only person that's been kicked out of school. <laughs> but that's my first example of power and love at its best. I spent six months building a home from the, group, from the ground up with a group of teenage boys, all of us knowing that the more efficient we were, the less it would cost for a low-income family to be able to buy that house. I had been asked to be a community builder when I was introduced to Youth Works, and I said, well, okay, yeah, it will help me pay off my fines and restitution, and it'll give me a little extra money, and you know, it will get my probation officer off my back. I'm, I'm in, you know. But when the reality sunk in that there's, that when things got real for me, I asked, when the reality, reality sunk in for me that what decisions we made were going to affect some family that we didn't even know yet and how much that house would cost them, it became real to me. That was again power and love at their best. We had the power to change lives for the better and the small prick of my heart changed me. I went from cold and uncaring because I had had enough of this world to knowing I could make a difference in this world. I didn't see the big picture then. It was money, governance, community, the partnership of many, power, using love and love using power. Both at their best and that's why I'm here today. I'm still a community builder today. I go by that house, it's still in my neighborhood. A new family moved in, I think, about a year ago. And uh, I brought my kids by the house. Probably too many times for, for them, you know. About a, a month ago, my 14-year-old said to me, Dad, isn't the house you built right over here somewhere? And I said, oh yeah, let's go look at it. Well, we don't have to go look at it, Dad. But. <laughs> so we drive up to the house, and I'm like, there it is. And my 11-year-old in the back seat says, yep, there's the house you built when you were 16 years old, Dad. <laughs> but um, that's why I'm still here today. Um, so I would just like to say that NeighborWorks will continue to carry the King legacy block by block, house by house, and neighbor by neighbor. Thank you for this honor. Thank you all for such wonderful, inspiring words, and, and congratulations again to our phenomenal award winners. We, um, we're very humbled and excited to honor you, so thanks for being with us. One last thing before we close. Um, you would never know, because every time I turn around, I see Reverend Davis on one of our campuses. He is a phenomenal supporter of Salt Lake Community College and, and has been for many, many years. Um, I consider him not only a wonderful advocate for the college, but a wonderful friend for me personally. And I want to thank you and invite you back up for one more round of applause and a gift from us for your time. Please join me also in thanking Marion Taylor and Jack Hesloff and Clifton for the great work that they did in planning the event.